seven and today is the annual nationwide ASA poster competition, but it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to everyone uh, John Kravosik and Neil Rodness. Both Neil and John uh, teach statistics in the in the Western Lake at the uh, same institution at Grand Valley State University of Michigan. Neil, uh, uh, as way of background, received his PhD in applied statistics in 1993. He attended. Northern Colorado University. John received his from Iowa State in 1999. Oh, and uh, by the way, John had taught high school math in Worcester, Ohio before that. Neil and John uh, have both uh, chaired the ASA poster competition for the state of Michigan in the past and today. They'll uh, explain to us how the program works and how you and your students can participate. So, gentlemen, take it away. Thanks, Paul. <coughs> Uh, by the way, this is Neil Rodgers. I'm going to be doing the, the first half or so of the webinar, and then uh, John will take a little bit there. And so the webinar is working with K through 12 students to create a statistics poster. Um, the, the statistic poster competition dates back to 1990. Since the mid 1990s, the ASA NCTM Joint Committee um, has provided oversight of the competition. Over the years, many state competitions have developed. At the end of this webinar, you'll find information regarding some of the resources that are available through many of these state competitions. The winners of the state competition are then forwarded on to the National Statistics Poster Competition. One such state competition, as Paul has already alluded to, is the Michigan Statistics Poster Competition, which has been in existence since 2000. So this webinar, as I mentioned, has two parts. The first part is primarily going to focus on some of the NCTM mathematics standards and how the Statistics Poster Competition can help meet these standards. And then the second part of the webinar is more concerned with the how-to of participating in the competition. So let's begin with the definition of what a statistics poster competition or what a, what a statistics poster is. You can see there it's defined as a visual display that uses one or more related graphs to summarize data, discuss different points of view, answer questions about, and explore data. So basically, we're talking about is a visual summarization of the data. And the statistics poster competition for K through 12 um, is, a, is um, certainly one way, um, very much in line with the mission of the ASA um, in terms of promoting the proper application of statistics and promotion development of statistical education for the public as well as the special. As you're likely already uh, very much aware, the NCTM is standard specific to statistics and probability. One such standard is the data analysis and probability standard, which states that students should be able to formulate questions that can be addressed with data and collect, organize, and display relevant data to answer them. The K through 12 post the competition provides an ideal way in which this standard can be met. It provides a great way to involve students' actual hands on research experience as well. The statistics poster competition has four submission categories K through 3, 4 through 6, 7 through 9, and 10 through 12. For instance, one of the posters received by the Michigan Statistics Poster Competition for the K through 3 category posed uh, this question, have the number of hurricanes that have hit the United States increased or decreased in the past 154 years? Another example of a poster submitted in the K through 3 category asked the question, What hand should you use? You have to put beans in a cup. Mm -hmm. 
either they said we gathered data from the girls' club at church. They had 15 seconds to put beans in a cup. They did this twice, first with a dominant hand and then with the other. As yet another example, this one is from the 10 through 12 category. One poster focused on the question, can people tell what type of water, whether bottled or tap, they choose as best tasting? To achieve that, students acknowledge that we signed 60 subjects to two different groups. The first had a sample, had sample one as tap water and sample two as bottled water. The second group had sample one as bottled water and sample two as tap water. In all three of these examples, the students formulated a question and collected data, which they then summarized and displayed one or more graphs on the poster. Um, another NCTM standard is concerned with the ability of students to clearly communicate their mathematical ideas. Again, the statistics poster competition provides a great way in which you can also meet this standard. As an example, a poster was submitted in the 7 through 9 category, which has the stated goal. This research is designed to explore what kinds of stuffed animals children of different ages and sexes play with. Included on the poster was this graph, which has the length of animals in centimeters along the x-axis, as you can see and the frequency along the y-axis. Um, further tallies were clustered according to the age groupings. And accompanying this graph was the explanation. The length and age of histogram shows the distribution of lengths of animals. If there was a relationship between the age and animal length, the histogram would have shown more yellow for the longer or the right side animals and more red toward the shorter or the left side animals. This was not the case. And yet another NCGM standard that can be met with the statistics post competition is the representation standard, which requires students to be able to create and use representations to organize, record, and to communicate mathematical ideas. So consider an example provided earlier, which was concerned with answering the question, what pan should you use if you have to put beans in the cup? The poster um, included in this graph is one in which the Y scale shows the age groups 6 through 7, 8 through 9, 10 through 11, 12 through 13, and 14 plus, whereas the X axis is the average number of beans per person be able to put in a cup using both their dominant and non-dominant hands. So the average value themselves are represented by images of the coffee bean. And the graph was accompanied by the conclusion that read, the dominant hand did put more beans in the cup on average, just like we guessed. Still another NCTM standard that can be met by the statistics poster competition is the measurement standard, which involves getting an understanding of measurable attributes of optics. As an example of this particular standard on how it was met, let's return to the prior example concerned with stuffed animals, which included measuring their lengths in centimeters. The poster included the explanation from the student that I wanted to know how to round and learn about categories. Math, I learned how to measure in centimeters and wanted to practice it. I just learned how to round to 10 and chose that as my category. The poster that was included, <coughs> and I'm sorry, the poster included that graph, which the x-axis is the animal length rounded to the nearest 10 centimeter value, and the y-axis is the frequency. Note that there are a total of 45 stuffed animals included on the graph, which included a statement from the student that I am John, and I'm doing a study about the stuffed animals of our family. We have lots of stuffed animals, and they are hard to put away. 
Mom thinks we don't have too many, but I think we do. Well, as you can see, the posters often include elements of humor, which the judges uh, appreciate having as well. So in addition to the NCM, the national standards, um, most, if not all states, have similar standards for mathematics as well. Again, the, the statistics poster competition provides a fun and uh, an ideal way in which to fulfill some of these standards. So, for instance, many of the webinar participants today are from Utah, but John and I found the mathematics standards for the various grade levels and in included standard five from Utah, which deals with elements of statistics and probability, including data collection and drawing conclusions from the data. And as the previous slide said, I encourage you to explore your own state mathematics standards and see how they the statistics poster competition can help fulfill these standards. At this point, I'm going to turn over control to my colleague, John Grabozik, who is the current director of the Michigan Statistics Poster Competition. John will then share some ideas and tips on more of the nuts and bolts behind the development of the statistics poster. John, it's all yours. Thanks, Neil. Hello, everybody. Uh, John Grabozik here. Before I go on to the next slide, I wanted to say a couple of things about Neil got to do some of the fun stuff there. And I particularly like the beans in a cup example, where the students say that their question is, what hand should you use if you have to put beans in a cup? Which apparently occurs a lot to kindergartners. They have to put beans in a cup quite often. And the last example where you showed the, the graph of the histogram and the stuffed animals, uh, we actually traveled to the site of the winning uh, students and we present awards to them. And that was one of our winners in Michigan a couple of years ago. And I remember talking to the student and him saying, I have to put all these stuffed animals away. I didn't realize that when we bought them. So I think uh, that that, thing, that kind of humorous thing can occur. Um, I'm going to talk about the creation of a statistics poster. And I'm going to break it down into three main ideas. First, how do you select a topic, uh, which can definitely be a challenge to come up with a good quality topic. Uh, determine how do you display them. How do you make graphs and how should you display and analyze your data graphically? And then probably the most important goal is the third one, which is communicating the message so the people judging the posters uh, can figure out what it is you're trying to say. Uh, first, selecting a topic. So probably the most important thing is to brainstorm ideas. And the way the poster competition is set up, if the students can grade K through 3, they can have as many as students as the entire class work on one poster. But in all the other grade categories, 4 to 6, 7 to 9, and 10 to 12, you can have up to four students. So when you're brainstorming, you can do that as a class. You can do it in, with this, in terms of four student groups or however you think is an appropriate way to do it. So what we found that works very well is just have students come up with very free thinking, uh, just kind of make a big list on the whiteboard or on a chalkboard of all the possible ideas and without trying to narrow them down at this point. And we encourage students to think beyond simply their school, to look at national issues, regional issues, and things that would be interesting to a judge outside of the school. Uh, after that sort of initial brainstorming idea, that usually generates a large number of possible ideas. Once students kind of get the idea of, well, I, just, I can talk about something that's of interest to me, that's interesting not just to my, my fellow classmates, but something that's of interest to me, like maybe politics or the environment. And so we keep it or sports, we keep it very broad at that point. Once you've got those initial ideas, then as a class or within groups, usually the biggest problem is the ideas are too broad. I was just at a school a couple days ago, we were talking about the poster competition, and I was asking them for ideas, and one student said, well, I want to do something on politics. I said, okay, that's a good idea, but it's a very broad idea. That could, you could have hundreds and hundreds of questions related to politics. So then we kind of encouraged them, well, what is it about politics you want to know? And he said, well, I want to know about the party affiliation of the people. And I want to know what affects that party affiliation, what issues might affect that. So we were able to kind of narrow it down and then get a little more information and sort of zero in on a question. Uh, next bullet on selecting a topic, once you come up with a question, the students actually have to be able to collect the data. And sometimes, this is 
not just to a student, but to researchers in general. They have a really good question, uh, but they don't have a way to collect data to answer the question. So making sure that there's a way to actually collect the data is critical. So we talk about discussing, discussing what the population is and how you would go about sampling from that population. Are you going to do an Internet search? Are you going to actually take a survey of individuals? Are you going to take a survey? How do you decide which individuals to survey? What happens if someone doesn't want to answer the questionnaire? Uh, if you're going to do an experiment, how do you actually go about conducting the experiment so that it can be repeated more than one time? And so somebody else can see how you conducted the experiment and they could uh, model the same experiment. And then also I think discussing with, with the students some of the challenges related to data collection. Uh, one thing I've found teaching a class of survey sampling and questionnaire design is sometimes you think you've written a perfectly understandable question. Everybody in class agrees it's perfectly understandable. Uh, but when you actually use it in a survey, the, the respondents don't find it perfectly understandable. So doing some sort of pilot study or survey of the people that are actually going to be the respondents will usually shed a lot of light on what's a good question and maybe what's not a good question. Uh, the next big topic is data collection. So I thought we'd kind of talk about a couple of examples here. So here's an example of a topic the students in the past have done posted on baseball. So a lot of students, especially in grades 7 to 9, like to do something related to sports. That's a very broad topic. So you need to kind of zero it in. Students, what question, what is it about baseball that you want to know? So here's an example. They could compare the number of home runs hit by the home run champion, the American League and the National League, baseball has two leagues, and they could do separate graphs for each. So that might be an interesting question because they're looking at a quantitative numerical variable, the number of home runs hit. They're not just looking at that, they're doing a comparison. And in grades 7 to 9, that's one of the key features, to have more than one graph that has different information. So doing some sort of comparison is usually a very good way of, of getting that information. Um, second example, television. Students watch a little bit of television, but they're not doing their homework right now. Uh, so a typical idea students come up with is to do a survey of the students at their school. So if the topic is television, they could ask something like, what's your favorite type of TV show, rather than usually what's your favorite show, because if you ask that question, you're going to get many different answers. It'd be very hard to summarize that in a graph. Uh, but if you ask a question like, what's your favorite type, there's only several different types. I guess I should put reality TV in there because that seems to be everywhere now. Uh, so if you get that information, then you can summarize it in graph, a bar chart, for example. And if you break it down by gender or the student's grade, then you've got a comparison. You've got something a little more interesting than just what's your favorite type of TV show. But really doing comparisons is critical. Uh, when you're displaying the information that you've collected, so a lot of times with students, will, what we find is that they thought through the process of the question, hopefully, they've collected the data, and then they're kind of making the graph, but they're not exactly sure how to put it all together and which graphs are appropriate. So the first thing they need to think about is the goal of the graph. And the most important goal is that the person that's reading the poster who's not intimately familiar with the topic, they have to be able to look at the graph and understand the story of the data. They shouldn't have to look at the graph and think through what is it they're trying to tell me? That should be pretty self-evident from the placement of the graph, how the graph connects to each other, to the logical progression. The reader can understand it just from looking at the graph, what the question was, sort of what the answer is as well. Uh, when, they're make, when you're making graphs, students are making graphs, they need to think about what type of data they have. And we break that down into two main categories, qualitative, or sometimes we'll hear that called categorical data, and quantitative data, which sometimes we'll hear called numerical data. Qualitative data is data that puts things in labels. So, for example, in the question where you're comparing the home runs to the home run champion between the American League and the National League, the number of home runs hit would be a quantitative numerical variable. The league the player plays in would be a qualitative variable. So you might say, well, the number Alex Rodriguez this year was the home run champion for the American League. He had 54 home runs. 54 is quantitative. The fact he plays in the American League, that's qualitative. Uh, quantitative data is numbers, and they need to be meaningful numbers. So, for example, at the end of the semester at Grand Valley, and probably this is true of every college, um, they 
do evaluations of the court, and the evaluations are on a Likert scale, so that number one means strongly agree, two means agree, three is I think neutral, four is disagree, and five is strongly disagree. So if that's the case, we would really consider that to be qualitative data. Just because we set the number on it, maybe it doesn't really make it quantitative. Now, once you decide the data is numerical, there's two main types, discrete, which is counting, so the number of home runs hit with the account, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And continuous, which are generally measurements. So if you're thinking about one of the interesting things in baseball, maybe more interesting than the number of home runs hit, is how much the, the person hit the home run, that home run champion, how much they weigh. And that's a quantit quantitative continuous variable. And what you would actually see if you looked at that over time is that players have gotten much, much bigger. So even Babe Ruth, who we kind of think of as a very hefty fellow, would be very small compared to the players nowadays. Um, going on with a couple examples. So here's an example of a qualitative. This is back to the beans in a cup. So one of the things that they kept track of was whether the person's dominant hand was left-handed or right-handed. And so that's a qualitative variable. You're labeling the person as left-handed or right-handed. And they made a pie chart of it. And it's very simple. It conveys the information perfectly. It's obviously hand done by the student. Now back to the second example for a continuous variable was the animal link. So they actually rounded this to the nearest three centimeters. And then they made a histogram of that information. So we would say for continuous data histogram, stem plot, you might call it a stem at least design, and or a box plot are very good, appropriate graphical summary. Uh, last thing related to the construction of the posters is the communication of the message. So that first bullet is by far the most important thing. Everything on the poster needs to be right. So that includes things like spelling and grammar, although sometimes you can speak by with mistakes on that. They're not quite as bad as mistakes in the statistics. But if you should be making a box plot for numerical data and you make a, a bar chart, then that's a big mistake. Or if you're doing something where you're supposed to be showing the data and you're doing a calculation and you actually calculate it wrong, obviously that would be a, a problem too. Um, second goal there is that there should be a unifying message. So once the students have zeroed in on that topic and they've broken it down. So they're thinking about hurricanes. They want to look at the frequency of hurricanes. All the graphs, all the information on the poster should deal with that question. There shouldn't be extraneous information that doesn't somehow add to the discussion of that question. So this example that you that's shown there is one of the Michigan competition last year, two years ago, I think it was. One of the winning posters was that post hurricane. Uh, next thing is that the the information, the different graphs that the students make, there should be some logical format or progression between the graphs on the poster. So in this example, the poster dealt with uh, air pollution. And so they were looking at different regions of the country and how much air pollution there was. And so there was sort of a logical progression where moving across the United States and looking at air pollution. Uh, be creative. So usually with grades, seven to nine, and grades four to six, A to three, that's the thing that we, that students have the least trouble with. They're very creative. Uh, but sometimes the creativity gets in the way of the message. So if, a, if you're going to have students going to be creative, they need to do it in such a way that it adds to the research question and it helps to explain. So for example, in this question, this student dealt with the new quarters that have come out. Each one has a different state on it. And they wanted to see, in Michigan, what's the frequency of how many Michigan quarters there are and how many Ohio State quarters. They were kind of curious as to, are the states nearby Michigan? Do we get more of those quarters than we do, say, a state like Tar Nevada that's not very close to Michigan? So you can see in the upper left-hand corner, they actually have a little graph of all the different quarters. You can't quite see what is there, but you can tell they're different. And then it's got a pie chart that shows the breakdown based on kind of region of country. And so they have multiple graphs there, but they're all looking at the same thing or looking, in a way, at how many quarters we have in the various states and comparing them. And they also have a graph there that's actually a time plot that looks at how they collected the data over time. Uh, pitfalls. So, Neil and I, of course, we don't think there are any pitfalls 
It's all wonderful. But sometimes things can happen when the students are working on the posters. Uh, first, these are things that we've seen as we judge posters that are kind of common mistakes. Uh, I'll, I'll let you read it. I'll just point out a couple of them. The first one is the third bullet. 3D items are not securely attached. So a lot of times students want to put glitter on a poster or they want to attach something that they think makes increases the creativity of the poster. But these things are getting mailed, they're getting handled quite a bit, and if something falls off, then the poster loses some of its attention. Uh, second thing is the fifth bullet down the topic is of marginal interest. So in grade seven to nine, it's fine to do something related to the particular student school, provided they don't sort of let us know what who the school is. Uh, but sometimes if you can go beyond what's of interest just to their to that particular city might increase its chances of doing well. Uh, here's a few winners from last year's American Statistical Association competition. So that's grades K to three there. Graph lots of color. Uh, grades K to three, quite often you'll see the graphs are done by hand. They don't have to be, but that's pretty typical, I think, of grades K to three. And there's the grades four to six winner came from Pennsylvania. Um, about hybrid cars, are they really more economical than non-hybrid cars? I think I remember their answer was no. Grade seven to nine, about uh, beverages. And then grade ten to twelve, a fourth one comparing the American Football Conference to the National Football Conference. There were actually two winners of grades ten to twelve, but that one dealt with drink, salt, drink. Now the last few slides just deal with some resources for you to uh, avail yourselves of. The first one is our Michigan Statistics Poster Competition website is listed there, and if you go to that website. You'll see a link that says Articles Describing Poster Creation. Neil and I wrote a series of articles that deal with pretty much what we talked about today, but in a little more detail. So if you want to get some additional information, that's a good place to go. Actually making the poster. So most of you probably are in a state that does not have its own. I don't think Utah has its own competition. Um, if the state has its own competition like Michigan, the posters are sent to the state competition. They're judged at the state level, and then the best posters in the state are sent on to the national competition. But if you're in a state that doesn't have its own competition, your posters, you would just send them all on to the national competition. So this is a timeline that we've used with our teachers in Michigan in the past, and they've said that they're able to get everything done without rushing too much. Uh, so in the middle of January, coming up with a topic, that might be after a couple of days at least, of, at least ahead of time, giving the students some brainstorming and some feedback on what the idea is actually done, get the data for it. So by the beginning of February, hopefully they have their data collected. By the middle of February, they've done their graphs. By the beginning of March, they've actually, they haven't put the poster together completely, but they've at least thought about what's the layout, where are the graphs going to go on the poster, what head, type of headings are we going to have for the graph, what's the heading for the entire poster, the title of the poster going to be. Uh, middle of March, the posters are done. The deadline to receive the posters is 1st of April and then April 19th. Next year is when the poster judging will actually take place. The posters should be sent to the Statistics Poster Competition, American Statistical Association. You have the address there. So if you have a state competition, you send it to the state. I think Nevada has a state competition. I have a slide here in a second to show that. Uh, but Utah, I don't think, has a state competition, so you would send the posters directly to national competition. And then there's a list of a few websites that correspond to different poster competitions. The top one is the, the ASA's national competition. There's the Michigan site, Pennsylvania, Nevada, Connecticut, Ohio, and New York City. New York City just started there this year, I think. It's kind of exciting. Uh, so they, those websites have information on their particular competitions. They also have the more general information that, like our website, for has those articles that you can look at to see more information on today's posters. And we're done. <laughs>